We we'll move on now to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 21449 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau, setting out revisions to this week's business. Uh, could I call on Liz Smith to move this motion? Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no member has indicated they wish to speak on the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 21449 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. The next item is a statement by the Cabinet Secretary for Health, Jean Freeman, on health COVID-19. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement. I would encourage all members who wish to contribute to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible and I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It is no exaggeration to say that the effort and sacrifice of the people of Scotland in complying with the restrictions that are in place has helped save thousands of lives. I know this has not been easy, but I cannot stress enough how much it matters and how much it is appreciated. We want to be clear with the public on what the future might look like and the principles that will shape any future decisions on easing any of the restrictions currently in place. Later this week, we will set out these principles that will guide us, the evidence we will use, the framework for our decision making. But this will not yet be a hard and flat, fast plan with dates because it's simply too early to be able to set out that level of detail. So again, I thank the people of Scotland for their com compliance with the rules, for their patience and for their continued support. Our aims now and as we look to shape the next steps need to take, as we need, look to take different ways to live with the virus are to minimise its impact, continue to protect our NHS and social care services and to protect lives. As of nine o'clock this morning, there have been 8,672 positive cases confirmed, an increase of 222 from the numbers reported yesterday. A total of 1,866 patients are in hospital with COVID-19 and that is an increase of 57 from yesterday. A total of 166 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. And that is a decrease of three since yesterday. However, in the last 24 hours, 70 more deaths have been registered of patients who've been confirmed as having COVID-19, taking the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 985. And as always, we remember that behind those numbers are human beings, fathers, daughters, mothers, cousins, friends, all of whom meant so much to those that they've left behind. And again, I extend my condolences to all of those who've lost loved ones. Presiding officer, the work our health service has undertaken to treble ICU capacity and incre increase bed availability has ensured that we have kept, so far kept the number of cases below our capacity to cope. To ensure that capacity is there, we completed the construction of the NHS Louisa Jordan in Glasgow over the weekend. In just over three weeks, we have planned, developed and constructed a hospital that now stands ready for patients. We continue to hope that this temporary facility will not be needed, but its creation gives us greater certainty that our NHS will have the capacity it needs in all circumstances. The effort initially from the army and the support they gave us and then significantly from frontline NHS staff, construction and support staff and SEC staff has been awe-inspiring and I'm sure everyone in the chamber shares my gratitude for their remarkable achievement, for the pride with which they worked and for the continued effort they make to be ready. This virus is a particular and serious threat to the most vulnerable in our society. Amongst those are our oldest citizens and those with underlying conditions. That means that protecting the residents of care homes is vital, just as it is during flu season and when they experience outbreaks of norovirus. Guidance on isolation in care homes has been established for some time, requiring clear social distancing, active infection prevention and control, and an end to communal activity. But to provide clarity, I am today setting out a tailored series of additional steps we are taking to support staff and residents. 
I have required NHS directors of public health to take enhanced clinical leadership for care homes. This will, for the first time, see these NHS directors reporting on their initial assessment of how each home is faring in terms of infection control, staffing, training, social distancing and testing, and the actions they intend to take to rectify and rectify quickly any deficits they identify. To supplement this new clinical oversight, we are establishing a national rapid action group comprising the key partners with operational responsibility in this area, recognising that care homes are primarily operated by independent providers. This group will receive daily updates and activate any local action needed to deal with issues as they emerge, as well as coordinate our wider package of support to the sector. In addition, we're, equi we're equipping the care inspectorate for an enhanced role of assurance across the country, including greater powers to require reporting. Testing for staff and residents is being expanded, including all symptomatic residents of care homes. COVID-19 patients discharged from hospital to a care home should have given two negative tests before discharge. I now expect other new admissions to care homes to be tested and isolated for 14 days, in addition to that, in an addition to the clear social distancing measures the guidance sets out. I need to be clear that testing is not an alternative to following the guidance on social distancing, on ending communal activities and enhancing infection prevention and control. But it can and does provide a necessary assurance to family members of those already in care homes and to those who are being admitted to care homes that is important and an assurance, of course, to staff. We're working to get students and social retirees and returners uh, into the system as quickly as possible. And we're now supporting care homes to recruit these additional staff. Employers have direct access to the SSSC recruitment portal, enabling quick and effective redeployment of care workers. Over 80 staff have already been matched for work in care homes or care at home under the new portal, and more will be joining them in the coming weeks. I've spoken to a number of stakeholders in recent days, and I thank them for their support. In particular, I'm pleased that Scottish Care, who represent the majority of care homes in Scotland, agree that this strategy and approach is the right one. We owe enormous gratitude to workers safeguarding our most vulnerable loved ones in care homes and at home. To ensure that staff have the PPE they need, we're increasing access to NHS PPE to care homes. Whilst care homes have their own supply route as before, we've undertaken to supplement that, recognising the additional demand on them at this time. There have been over 60 million items distributed to social care since we launched the triage helpline for that sector on the 19th of March. And this week, we've also begun delivery of a week's supply of aprons, gloves and fluid-resistant surgical masks direct to every single care home, prioritising those with known outbreaks and completing all of that delivery by the end of this week. The demand for PPE is, of course, a huge global challenge, but we are doing all we can to ensure continued supply and distribution. On top of the supply of NHS PPE to care homes, we have delivered over 80 million items to Scottish hospitals and provided eight weeks supply to GPs and primary care in Scotland. Global demand as a result of this pandemic is huge and we continue to run what is now a 24 seven operation to procure the supplies we need for Scotland. In addition, we are also working on a four nation basis with our colleagues in the rest of the UK. We are continuously updating our guidance in line with the science as our understanding develops so that workers have clarity on the type of PPE they should wear and in which setting or scenario. I should be clear though that the guidance from Public Health England, which they issued last week <clears throat> on actions to undertake in the event of shortages did not apply to Scotland. We continue to have sufficient stocks of PPE, but we continue to have to work hard and every single day to ensure that orders arrive on time, that delivery volumes are as ordered, 
and that we source new, new deliverers, new suppliers into the market. As always, if staff have concerns, we need to hear about those and they can contact us through that direct dedicated PPE email address, which is, and I shall give it again, covid-19-health-ppe at gov.scot. Work has also been continuing on increasing our NHS testing capacity and we're on track to meet our target of 3,500 by the end of this month. By that time, every health board will have local testing capacity and we're working across academia and the independent sector to increase that further. In addition to our own efforts to increase testing, we again work on a four nation basis to increase testing capacity in Scotland as part of the UK effort. Increasing our PCR test capacity and looking forward to emerging other forms of testing if they are validated will be essential to plans for the future. Our work now on testing matters now, but we are also building the testing infrastructure we will need as we move to the next phase. Our capacity to test, trace and isolate will be critical to controlling the virus. Presiding officer, we are witnessing the most significant transformation of health and social care in a generation. Tripling our ICU capacity, mass massively scaling up and extending our procurement service, creating a new hospital in three weeks, protecting hundreds of thousands of our most vulnerable, welcoming thousands of NHS and social care returners, student nurses, midwives, AHPs and medics to support our communities and our NHS are just some of what has been undertaken. All of this is testimony to the professionalism, the dedication and the sheer hard work of those who work in and lead our NHS and social care. And to the people of Scotland who have stuck by the rules, stayed at home, maintained social distance, sacrificed the contact with family and friends that mean so much and the pleasures they otherwise enjoy. That transformation and those sacrifices are impressive beyond words. But alongside that, our NHS remains open. From the GP services to A&E to urgent care, all are open and ready to care for those who need it. So to everyone, please do not hesitate to come forward if your condition or that of your child or your family member concerns you. If you have symptoms, seek help by contacting your GP, calling NHS 24 or attending A&E for urgent symptoms. The NHS is ready to cope with COVID. It is coping with COVID-19, but it remains open for all those other important and urgent health issues that it does so well to care for. The NHS and our social care services continue to scale up, continue to work to protect the health of people in Scotland, and we continue to do all we can to support them. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. We have, uh, as you'd imagine, a large number of members who wish to ask a question. Uh, hopefully, we'll have relatively concise questions and similar answers. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. Ministers have stated that delayed discharge will be reduced by a further 500 this month. Can I ask, how many of these patients are actually still in hospital today? And given the concerns raised regarding current staffing levels in care homes across the country, how many of these in patients, as it envisaged, will be moved to care homes? Cabinet Secretary. So delayed discharge has reduced by, I think, from memory, but if I'm wrong, I'll correct it later, 62% since the 4th of March. So we have just over 600 uh, individuals still in hospital who uh, clinically no longer need to be there. The numbers of those who have been discharged over that period who have gone to care homes or to care at home, I don't have with me, but we will get that figure for you as best we can from Health and Social Care Partnerships and make sure that you and other members have that. Um, the, the other point I should make is that one of the issues that is being revealed as we work so hard for delayed discharge, it has been a significant achievement, is that there are particular issues around support that is needed for those adults with incapacity issues and for those adults with significant mental health or behavioural issues. And we are working now to introduce what needs to be done there, not just for this point in terms of the pandemic, but for the longer term, so that we can continue to deliver to those individuals the care and support that they need. 
Thank you. Monica Lennon to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The latest data is that around one in four COVID-19 deaths have happened in care homes and there's persistent evidence that care workers are working in this precarious environment without the basic equipment they need, masks and gloves and so on. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the, the email address that the government uses. Can I ask how many people have emailed that account about PPE? And whilst I, I welcome the creation of the National Rapid Action Group, I do recall that the, the NHS was put on an emergency footing by the Cabinet Secretary on the 17th of March. Is the care sector now on an emergency footing? And if not, why not? Cabinet Secretary. So <clears throat> let me take those, those, I think, probably three questions in turn. In terms of the email address, uh, to date, uh, from the 1st of April, when uh, it was initiated, we've received 1,636 emails. Uh, in terms of those emails that are considered urgent, they are turned around and dealt with in 12 hours. Uh, next is two to three days. Others take longer as we try to work through exactly what needs to happen and check what the question is against uh, what the information is that we get back from boards or from social care or a particular care home. Uh, I am currently looking at whether or not we need to increase the staffing for that because it needs to be um, around the clock not necessarily overnight, but around the clock operation uh, because of, of how people email in their concerns. As those concerns come in, as I said, it has a, a ministerial engagement in it uh, and some of those are acted on quickly. Um, boards now have a single point of contact in terms of PPE. Uh, those individuals meet virtually uh, once a week at least. Uh, and uh, the Minister Concerned joins that meeting as often as possible to try and understand exactly where there might be particular issues. The, the, the situation in care homes is, of course, as, as Ms Lennon will know, that the majority of our care homes are private enterprises. Uh, about 20% from memory are local authority run care homes. So there is a real mix here in the public private sector. And in terms of our uh, oversight as government in that area, it is not as direct and clear as it is for our National Health Service. However, what I have outlined is a significant increase in clinical intervention and oversight. And that's why I said in the statement that I had worked with partners to secure their agreement, and importantly, Scottish Care, so that we have much greater direct intervention and control and support into individual care homes to ensure that the guidance that went out in the second or third week of March that was specifically uh, established in order to break any possible transmission of the virus. It's harsh guidance. It's about residents having to be in their own rooms, all communal activity ending, uh, as well as the infection prevention and control support for staff and their PPE and their training and their confidence in that. All of that in place and active should not have seen the level of transmission that we have seen in care homes. So now we need to increase our clinical oversight, our care inspectorate inspection of those areas, uh, as well as ensuring through the direct delivery of PPE and other measures that we are offering the maximum support to care homes that we can, bearing in mind that they remain private enterprises for the most part. And so we need to agree that level of intervention and support with them, notwithstanding the standards that they are required to meet for their care inspectorate registration. Thank you. Alison Johnson to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you. I've spoken with scientists, including Professor Debbie Bogart, an expert in infectious disease who strongly advocates a test, trace, isolate strategy, the response urged by the World Health Organization. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain why our testing capacity in Scotland continues to be underused? Indeed, we're close to the bottom of the EU testing table. And the Cabinet Secretary will be aware too, as well as testing, we need to have a capacity to trace. Um, can she inform the Chamber what action is underway in that regard also? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so I'm sure Ms Johnson will remember that at the very start of this, when we were in what we described as the containment phase, then we did undertake that test trace and uh, isolate, generally speaking, in people's own homes at the time. 
At the very start of all of this, the NHS in Scotland had two labs capable of undertaking in total 350 tests a day. That has now increased significantly. Uh, all boards now have access to laboratory facilities and the testing capacity has increased, as Ms Johnson said, to the level it has and will increase and meet that 3,500 target with the additional capacity I spoke about in my statement. <clears throat> we set out in this phase to say that testing would be used as we significantly increase capacity over a very short space of time, that we would use testing for those who were patients in hospital, for surveillance and to help critical key workers return to work. <clears throat> what we have seen, and that uh, critical key workers is not only in health and social care, but also uh, extended to prison service staff, police, ambulance, fire and rescue. What we have seen though is a low level of uptake uh, there. We will look now, uh, we are looking now at extending uh, the availability of that testing to other workers in key areas. You'll recall the three categories of key workers uh, that we published uh, to other workers in key areas. But the point of the significant increasing to 3,500 but beyond that uh, is in order to get us ready to do that test, trace and isolate as we move in any respect from the current severe restriction measures to any easing of those uh, depending on where the evidence takes us on that and the decisions that are made that I uh, indicated at the start of, this, of the statement. Whatever we do, test, trace and isolate is critical at that point particularly to ensure that we can retain control of the virus's spread and continue to keep case numbers under the NHS's capacity to cope with those. So all of that will become clearer uh, as we produce, uh, as we increase that capacity and we will uh, update Parliament as we do that and as we also increase our health protection teams capacity, local health protection teams, because they are the ones that lead the tracing uh, and then the advice on isolating. Thank you. Uh, we've got um, 13 members still wish to ask questions. I would urge uh, the Minister in particular to be slightly more concise if possible. I know these are very difficult matters and a lot of detail. Alex Will Hamilton to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Alex Will Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I welcome the announcement on testing in care homes? Willie Rennie and the Lib Dems have asked for this for several weeks, and this shift in policy will keep people safer. Colin Miller, the Chief Executive of Scottish Care, this week voiced anger at the Scottish Government's failure to end the continued exposure of personal assistance to risk and infection transmission. He says that the telephone support line refuses calls from these social care workers because they are not care inspectorate registered. Those who deliver care in the home as personal assistants are, in, are in, in as much danger as care home staff. Will she intervene to ensure they are no longer stonewalled by the PPE helpline? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I will. But before I do that, I need to say here in this chamber, and I will be writing to uh, spy in themselves, I need to apologise for the fact that we have not resolved this up until now. Um, it is these, this is a really important group of people. The individuals that they are caring for are very important individuals. And uh, there is no reason at this point whilst, why they cannot access PPE. So my apology goes alongside my assurance that before I leave to go home tonight, we will have resolved this. There is no reason why it cannot be resolved. And Mr. Cole Hamilton, but more importantly, those personal assistants have my personal assurance that we will resolve this by the end of today. Annabel Ewing to be followed by Brian Whittle. Hey, thank you, presiding officers. The MSP for Cowden Beath constituency. Can I just take this opportunity to thank all NHS Fife staff and all care sector workers in Fife for their unstinting uh, dedication. Over the last weeks, we have witnessed a really unimaginable and indeed hugely commendable community buy into lockdown. Can I ask the cabinet secretary how she plans to build on that in the planning for the next steps, recognising, of course, at all times, the hugely different circumstances pertaining in communities, in villages, in towns and in cities right across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. So in part, the answer to that question is, as the First Minister set out um, only a few days ago, in terms of the, the uh, document we will publish later this week that sets out the 
uh, the approach that we intend to take towards reaching those decisions. It doesn't set out what those decisions will be, but it does set out the criteria that will be used, the evidence that we will uh, use, how we will make all of that as transparent and public as possible, and attempts to engage in hearing what the communities want to say back to us about the approach that they want us to take and the various easing of measures that may be possible whilst we retain control of the virus. The important thing to remember in all of this is that what we are looking to do from a situation with severe restrictions on people's everyday lives in order to control the virus is identify in what way can any of those restrictions be eased whilst we continue to live with the virus. It's not going away, it still is with us. We need to continue to manage the virus as best we can. And that's why test, trace and isolate is so important. But the other steps and the balance of the evidence that we will look to uh, and the decisions that we will reach, we will set out as clearly as possible because that is the best way for people to understand the rationale for anything that we decide to do and to secure their support and their commitment to continue to work with us as we try to manage this virus and minimise the loss of life. Thank you. Brian Whittle to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I asked you uh, last Friday about the procurement process for those Scottish companies who have offered either to manufacture or access PPE. And I recognise, of course, there is the need uh, for due diligence, as you indicated in your answer, but can I ask on behalf of those companies in this situation why it's taking so long for the initial engagement with these com companies, sometimes as much as three weeks, and is there a way in which that delay can be tackled? Secretary. So much of this work, as I, I said to uh, Mr Whittle on Friday, uh, is a collaboration between myself and Mr McKee and the group that he uh, leads with Scottish Enterprise and others. So in terms of a direct answer to your question, I don't have that just now, but you have my commitment uh, to work with Mr McKee to look at all the companies that have come forward to us, what has happened with those uh, individual companies, what the process is, and whether or not there is any room to speed up that process and return to you in the next few days with that answer. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, according to National Records of Scotland, 3,400 people died from contagious diseases in Scotland in 2018, including 364 from influenza and 1,670 from pneumonia. Does the Scottish Government have any information yet on the lockdown's positive impact on reducing the number of deaths from infectious diseases other than COVID-19, such as pneumonia and influenza? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, we don't uh, have detailed information on that yet, although it will be a very interesting piece of information that we do have. We do have some indication that some of the infections that generally arise because we don't wash our hands well enough are declining, uh, and that is a spur should be a spur to us all to continue to pay attention to that really important public health message about washing our hands. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Shona Robertson. Could I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's additional measures for care homes? The 15 deaths at Crosslet House Care Home have now become 16 following the death of a resident yesterday. Senior managers, as late as yesterday, were claiming that the home is COVID-19 free. That's despite at least two local GPs diagnosing residents with COVID-19, five staff testing positive, and one member of staff now in hospital. In a shameful piece of spin that would frankly make most politicians blush, the council claimed they are following guidelines, giving the impression to families that they are testing residents, but they haven't tested a single resident, not one. They are not even being accountable to their local councillors who are being refused in information. So will the cabinet secretary instruct an urgent investigation and tell Western Berkshire Council that they must test their care home residents and not allow older people to be treated as second class citizens. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, what I will do, it, because what Ms Bailey has just uh, outlined is uh, utterly shameful and completely unacceptable. What I will do is this afternoon I will ask the relevant Director of Public Health uh, to immediately uh, take steps to look at what is happening in that care home to ensure that residents are tested who are uh, symptomatic uh, and to uh, advise me on what additional steps 
uh, they think should be taken now with that particular care home, as we are asking all directors of public health now to, to do with every care home across Scotland. Shona Robson to be followed by Bill Bowen. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of concerns raised by essential workers, including those caring for the most vulnerable in our community, such as care workers, who have previously been told they will only be entitled to statutory sick pay rather than the 80% of salary offered to non-essential workers should they self-isolate. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide more detail on the funding agreement that was reached between the Scottish Government and COSLA for sick pay in cases where care workers are ill or self-isolating? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, that funding agreement was that we would meet the, the, any additional costs required uh, by local authorities or others to ensure that those who were care workers, those who are care workers, who were uh, off sick because of COVID-19 or isolating because of COVID-19 or at home uh, looking after uh, someone else who was, uh, for whom they had caring responsibilities, that their sick pay could be met in full. Bill Bowman to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you. Uh, Macmillan Cancer Support are concerned about the lack of clarity around the guidance on visiting someone at the end of life who is dying at home. As they say, currently it's not listed as an exemption to leave the House in the Government guidelines. Will the Cabinet Secretary set out gu guidance around this with regard to all settings, including home and non-home settings, so that people are able to say goodbye to their loved ones safely, regardless of where that might be? So the, the guidance that we set out, but it, it may be sensible for us to repeat this um, by the various um, media platforms that we use, uh, the guidance that we set out or where we ended visiting uh, at care homes and in hospitals uh, and other settings had a number of exemptions and one of those exemptions was to be with a loved one uh, at the end of their life. Uh, other exemptions are in terms of a uh, birthing partner, if someone uh, is your partner when you are giving birth. Uh, the other is where, where the person in your family or your loved one suffers from dementia and not having you present uh, increases their anxiety and their distress. Uh, and uh, the fourth one I can't remember, forgive me. But we will, uh, I will make sure that all members know all four of those exemptions and we will look again at whether or not we need to uh, make those more public so that people are clear uh, that certainly end of life and those other steps that I've taken, those other measures I've taken, there are exemptions to the current uh, uh, ban on visiting. Thank you. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Sarah Boyer. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, several weeks ago it emerged that 17.5 million or so antibody tests bought by the UK government were found to be unreliable by scientists at Oxford University, and I am aware that work is ongoing to identify reliable testing kits. Can the Cabinet Secretary update us in relation to the Scottish Government's work in sourcing such tests, and does she continue to believe that antibody testing will be a useful tool in helping to beat this virus and ease the lockdown? Cabinet Secretary. So, the, the current evidence so far is, so far, there has not been yet developed a successful antibody test. And there is a degree of evidence that, um, indicates that it's not clear that if you have COVID-19, whether to the degree to which you do develop antibodies in, in uh, immunization in, in your own system, and if you do, for how long. So all of those factors make the development of the test more complicated. Uh, there's a great deal of work going on. A lot of that work involves uh, researchers and others from Scotland as part of uh, both a UK and a European uh, exercise and in some instances a global exercise but at this point there is no uh, successful and clinically robust antibody test whilst all the work goes on to try and develop one. Thank you. Sarah Boyack to be followed by Bob Doris. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what her plans are for opening the new Division of Clinical Neurosciences facility at Little France in Edinburgh in May in the light of senior medical staff concerns that this could be a dangerous distraction at a time of our greatest need and that the DCN move should be delayed until the pandemic is over and it can be carried out in a safe, orderly and sensible manner? Cabinet Secretary. So it is a positive that the DCN part of the new site is... Uh, ready on track as we had hoped it would be. However, some of those senior clinicians that Ms Boyack refers to uh, wrote to me uh, expressing those concerns. And I know that since that time, there have been a number of discussions 
between them and others and the uh, medical director for NHS Lothian uh, to look at whether or not there is any level of service that can safely be moved to the new site without compromising both the work and uh, the efforts of staff uh, uh, currently dedicated towards addressing uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. I believe that they have reached a view in terms of outpatient services, uh, but that is still, I think, to be finalised and those discussions continue. The, the clinicians are, are right to prioritise what needs to be done right now, uh, but it is important that if there is any level of service that can be moved, that doesn't compromise those efforts, then that steps are taken to do that. But that needs to uh, be minimising any disruption to the work that those clinical teams are undertaking right now. And Bob Doris. Cabinet Secretary, today's Evening Times raised concerns about agency staff in care homes being moved across the care home estate and potentially increasing the risk of infection. Uh, I'm also aware of staff also being deployed across various units within the CRK care home setting, necessarily due to significant staff shortages as employees have to self-isolate. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the new National Rapid Action Group will review and clarify guidance in this area and ensure that it is rigorously, rigorously enforced in case this could save lives? And does she agree that once testing of symptomatic staff is routinely conducted, that staff absence will be reduced and less will need to be redeployed and less agency staff will be required? Cabinet Secretary. So um, I'm grateful to Mr Doris for that question. In terms of basic infection prevention and control, staff should not be moving from uh, one part of a care home or one care home that is, uh, has co uh, COVID positive patients to another that doesn't because that is uh, basic uh, infection prevention and control. And so the um, directors of public health will be looking to ensure that, that if that is happening, it stops. Um, it should not be happening in any circumstance, certainly not in these circumstances. Uh, it, certainly testing increasing, the availability of testing, it is available for social care staff uh, to be tested or the family member if they are engaged in household isolating may help. I know that some parts uh, of Scotland have been very successful in ensuring that numbers go through at pace. Uh, but in addition, there should be no need for agency staff to be used given that we have those numbers, 20,920 in total of uh, individuals who are returning to the health and social care workforce and who uh, NES and uh, NHS uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, NHS Lothian and the SSSC portal are working through at pace in order to deploy. My statement said 81, there's a further 126 uh, ready and available for services uh, to be uh, in terms of social care and there will be more coming forward including 1,854 student nurses who've been placed in community settings. So we need to ensure that care home owners and managers understand how to access these uh, skilled clinical workers uh, with experience uh, and with commitment in order to make up any shortfall they have in their permanent staffing numbers. Thank you. Apologies to Anas Sauer, Andy Whitman and Neil Finlay, but I'm afraid we have to move on to the next item of business. Just remind members that if they're leaving or entering the chamber, just to be careful again about social distancing measures, but that concludes this statement. <laughs>